Welcome into the PFF podcast. Steve Palazzolo here with Sam Monson. This time, Mike Renner, unexcused absence, right? Always. We, he was excused last week. Well, that's true. Almost always. He's had one excused absence and many unexcused absences. He claims he's sick. He was a game time decision. The voice was just not up to snuff. So he could not host today. So Mike is out. Just Sam and I. We're going to fly through every single game. Hopefully give you guys something to watch for for this weekend. Ready to do it, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. Let's roll. Let's roll right through it. All right. New York Jets at the New Orleans Saints. New Orleans. Is that how you pronounce it? It's not how I pronounce it, but you know, you, you have your own style of pronunciation. I don't like doing it that way. Announcers do it like that. I, don't, I like New Orleans. Oh, really? Almost New Orleans. Well, that seems to have gone Nolans. yeah, almost too far the other way. That's how I would do it, though. All right, what do you want? What are you looking for in this game? Jets and Saints. The Saints are nine and four, tied atop the AFC South with the Carolina Panthers, but coming off a loss last week against the Atlanta Falcons. What are we looking for here? Well, Alvin Kamara being back after the concussion, knocking him out of that game to ruin the fantasy dreams of many a people, me included. Many a people, many a person, me included. I did give away my fantasy strategy on Twitter mm -hmm. last week. It's a very important one. If you just dominate the regular season, yeah. earn a buy, you don't have to worry about week one. That's what I did in my leagues. Okay. Um, my sister has been insisting that I run her fantasy team for her all that, season. That can't be good. Did you just use PFF's tools and Pretty much, point yeah. you in the right way? And playoffs. Um, but Kamara being injured destroyed her team last week, detonated her playoff at 10. Oh, so. That's not right. I, I feel like that's a lot of people, unless they earned a buy like I did. Yes. Um, he's coming back for me, though. How good has he been when he's been on the field? Oh, he's been fantastic. I mean, he has been held back only by the amount of uh, touches the Saints have given him. Every time he gets the ball, he seems to be doing something phenomenal, um, breaking tackles, hurdling people, gaining yards after contact, making good cuts. Uh, he's been absolutely incredible. Um, is he our number one graded back right now? He's certainly in the top couple. Um, yeah, seven yards per carry, 4.3 yards after contact per rush. Uh, just this unbelievable like slipperiness to him when people are trying to tackle him. Yeah. All right. Run game, pass game, <laughs> he could do it all. Uh, Mark Ingram's on another one of my fantasy teams too. I think they kind of ride both of those guys in the run game as well. Uh, the Jets uh, continue to just play teams tough week in, week out. Yeah, they did get uh, destroyed by Denver last week, but uh, when Josh McCown was healthy, they were playing teams tight. Now we have active christian hackenberg probably oh, man we get the hackenberg jersey over here at the office and the helmet and we have the helmet we have helmets for every team uh i say if hackenberg plays we'll get you in the helmet and jersey and you get to uh duplicate it on monday you get to relive whatever it was that he did reenact the hackenberg reenact plays. is the word i'm looking for sam uh bryce petty's gonna get the start uh, hackenberg will be in a football jersey though. i think i can be at least as accurate as christian hackenberg throwing the football we shall see it. There's a lot of great draft discussion right now about Lamar Jackson. Can can he even play quarterback at the NFL level? And Better here's Christian Eichenberg. Here's that. Hack, a second round pick a couple years ago. Uh, we're, I think we're all taking the Saints here. The uh, playoff picture starting to come into focus, but also very cloudy in the NFC. Can the Saints? You know, are the Saints now the favorite in the NFC? Because even though they're coming off the loss, Wentz is hurt. And Drew Brees still sitting there as one of the best quarterbacks in the league. They're definitely right still in there despite that loss. Um, obviously, Wentz going down, the Vikings offensive line has been pretty decimated the past couple of weeks there. I mean, they're not in trouble, but they're a lot weaker than they were a couple of weeks ago because of that. The one interesting Jets thing that I want to see this week, though, is, okay, Bryce Petty is going to be the quarterback, and that's probably not a great thing for them. But Bryce Petty is coming out of a system that was all about the deep ball and uh, Robbie Anderson at wide receiver has been the premier deep receiver in the league for the past few weeks. Those two could connect easily for a couple of big plays, which, you know, I mean, that could swing a game that they shouldn't be in. You know, they could make this feasibly a lot closer than, the, than it looks on paper. And they had good chemistry in the preseason. Yeah. Uh, you know, this year. And, you know, so I think there there is something there. Keep an eye on New Orleans, the offensive line, number one pass blocking efficiency. And Drew Brees facing the lowest pressure percentage in the league, 23% of dropbacks. That's it. So there's a lot of good pieces in New Orleans, and that's why we're taking them. All right, another big game here, the Los Angeles Chargers going to Kansas City. The Red Hot Chargers going to Kansas City with AFC West supremacy on the line. The Chargers have started to finally look like the team, not finally, but the last few weeks, look like the team that we thought they were coming into the year. And... 
that is a well-rounded bunch, a team that has guys like Joey Bosa and Melvin Ingram off the edge, uh, Casey Hayward, who is the subject of our hashtag well actually segment this week. We talked about him as maybe the best corner in the entire NFL. And Phillip Rivers, last four weeks, top-graded quarterback by PFF grades. What are we th- thinking about this game? Chargers are just red hot. Yeah, they really are. Um, it really, their fortunes turned around as soon as Mike jumped off the bandwagon, the Super Bowl bandwagon. Suddenly they started playing when that happened. Um, I'm not saying one caused the other. I'm just presenting the facts. Pure facts. Mike jumped off at the wrong time. I yeah. Think. Um, and the Chiefs got back on track this past week against the Raiders. But was that just because they played the Raiders? You know, when we worked out all these stats and started looking at the win projections through the remainder of the season, the Raiders were the one team that the PFF numbers suggested would fall away from the pack from those three 500 tied teams at 6-6. Six and six. Um, the, the, the analytics suggested it would be the Chiefs and the Chargers, and really this was the game that is going to separate which one of them takes that division. Um, that's what the numbers said all along, and I think that's the way it's going to end up uh, working out. At the moment... I asked the guys this uh, heading into today. They say there's a slight edge to the Chargers in this game with the analytics. Um, and it really comes down to the difference, the confidence level you have in Philip Rivers versus Alex Smith. You know, Smith has played at, at Rivers' level at times this season, but not consistently and certainly not against guys um, like Casey Hayward or the best pass rushing duo in the league lately. So that's the big question there is Al- can Alex Smith have a big game? against a team like the Chargers when you expect Phillip Rivers to have a big game on the other side? Um, or And what impact will being at home have? Is that enough to, to sway any potential advantage? In the first matchup, Rivers was terrible. And basically since that point, he's been outstanding. But in the first game, no touchdowns, three interceptions, could easily have had four or five. Uh, those, and he was throwing those passes where it was like, all right, what's this guy doing? Class of 2004, these guys are getting old. Rivers is losing his arm. He can't throw these deep corner routes anymore. But honestly, since that point, uh, he's really settled down. And that that passing offense has just a great flow now. Keenan Allen is a top five receiver this year. So good off the line of scrimmage. Tyrell Williams is a deep threat. Uh, Hunter Henry, one of the most underrated tight ends in the entire NFL right now. Our number one guy because he's so efficient uh, as a receiver. That is a tough offense to slow down but Darrell Rivas knocked the rust off last week so this week he's going to be basically 2009 again was it rust or cobwebs was he sitting in cobwebs at home or was he out in the rain rusting up what was he doing that's a good question I can't remember the metaphor that he used but either way he had to he had to restore the luster of his previous great self and he did that last week one catch from seven targets so this week, we're going to be seeing the 2009 version of Rivas all over again. Oh, yeah. Right back to 2009, the best cornerback play we've ever seen. All right, who do you have in this one? Uh, I went with the Chiefs, and I don't have a good reason why, so don't ask for one. Oh, good. So I went with the Chargers. I'm leaning with uh, the PFF analytics. By the way, you'll be hearing from those guys later. That's George <laughs> and Eric Eager. I'm pretty sure that's the exact pronunciation of George. It's uncanny. But uh, they'll be giving you your general uh, pick of the week, your lock of the week. All right, next game, another rematch, another division matchup. Houston Texans traveling to Jacksonville. The Jaguars are somehow, uh, you know, somehow in this. Uh, we're looking for a buy yeah. mix. You know, if if Pittsburgh can beat New England and Jacksonville wins out, Jacksonville is the team that's going to be not only getting a home game for the playoffs, the first one since uh, 1999, but a buy. There would also be their first buy since '99, obviously. So. Uh, what are we seeing in this game? First time around, uh, Jacksonville's defensive line really destroyed Houston's O-line. Yes. and That was week one, by the way, many, many weeks ago. Yeah, and honestly, not much has changed. The, this Jacksonville defensive front is still one of the best in football, and the Houston offensive line in terms of pass protection is still the worst in football. So this should be a train wreck in that regard. Uh, they still have Tom Savage, a quarterback, having gone back um, from Deshaun Watson because of his injury. So, I, I mean, looking at it on paper, there's just no way that the Texans get out of this alive in terms of the offensive side of the ball. The only thing they have going for them is New Hopkins playing fantastically, but he's now going up against the best cornerback tandem in the NFL. I mean, I, there's just no way they score enough points to win this game. Is that going to hurt my fantasy team, Sam? I have, I have New Hopkins. Then, yes, teams. yes, it's going to be a problem. Oh, man, that's not, not good for my playoff matchups this weekend. Uh, yeah, look, I, I think if you guys haven't seen Jacksonville play and you're still in like haha Jacksonville mode, you have to watch this defense. If you have DirecTV and it's 
you know, throw on channel 707 or whatever it is this week, go check out this Jags defense because from that defensive line to that talent in the secondary to linebackers too, the speed that they have at linebacker, they are uh, really building something special, particularly on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier in the week, they remind me a little bit of the Mark Sanchez led Jets where Sanchez, you could not objectively say he was a good quarterback necessarily, but he, you know, any quarterback can have a couple good games here and there. And Sanchez did at the right time and and in the playoffs in 2009 and 2010, Blake Bortles is kind of resembling that remark. These last couple weeks, some decent games that we've talked all season about how they can protect him a little bit with the run game and really trying to take the ball out of his hands and keeping it close with the defense. I don't think he's going to go out and win too many games for him, but this D makes them really dangerous down the stretch here. They might be more fundamentally sound than that Jets team as well because the the defense is being built essentially off just talent, vanilla, relatively vanilla scheme and, and pure out-executing, out-fighting you, whereas the Jets under Rex Ryan and his pomp, it was all scheme. You know, They never really had those elite pass rushes, but they were able to scheme up pressure fantastically. There was some boomer bust to his man coverage scheme exactly, and blitzing yeah. from all angles. And yep. The problem with that is, in order to scheme that pressure up, you have to do creative things that can lead to some big, nasty plays or basically just being figured out at times. Whereas when you're relying on guys just being better than the person trying to block them, it's tough to fix that. There's no scheme that, uh, that changes that. No, that's a good point. What do you, who are you taking in this one, Sam? The Jags. I can't see any way past that overwhelming um, mismatch between their, their front and the Texans' offense. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there, too. I'm going to take Jacksonville. Uh, yeah, they're rolling. They're uh, getting ready for some playoff action in Jacksonville. All right, Cincinnati Bengals will travel to the Minnesota Vikings. The, the Bengals... Really disappointing effort last week against tapped the out. Chicago Bears. I they, mean, that was they tapped out. They were done. Yeah, right. Uh, so that was pretty bad. They were coming off that Monday night game where they really should have beaten the Steelers or came close to beating the Steelers on Monday night. Seems like they were just done and tapped out, cashed out In against fact, Chicago. They didn't, they didn't just tap out. They tapped to strikes. You know, where you're just you're done with the game. You're, I'm, I don't want no part of this. There's no reason I really should give up here, but I'm not. I'm, I'm ring the bell. That was yeah, it. Fight's over. So I was talking to Zach a little bit. We were breaking down Mitch Trubisky's performance on the QB episode, and we talked about Cincinnati's linebackers and just how poorly they played. They were just running in circles in the pass game, misfitting in the run game. That doesn't bode well against this Minnesota passing attack. But it's okay because they're bringing in Ray Maluga for a visit. Oh, my gosh. So that should be all those problems solved. Oh, God. All right. Maluga's not – he's just – He's just a guy. He's a Jag. He's not a Jaguar. He's just he's a Jag at this point in his career. Any any reason to believe the Bengals can bounce back and uh, give the Vikings a game here? They have talent. I mean, if they decide, it, you know, we they're they're fresh off almost beating the Steelers. They should have beaten the Steelers, arguably. So they've definitely got the ability to do it. The question is, was last week an indication that they are just done with this season? Those guys are on a beach somewhere, chilling in the off season. Yeah. They're just waiting until they're actually officially allowed to leave. I can't um, imagine they're going to be as bad as they were last week. I think there was just this emotional letdown coming off Monday night. Yeah, I suspect it's hard to climb back off that to you know the kind of intensity levels they're going to want to get to. The Vikings, they're a much better team. I think it's just going to come down to how healthy they're on, they are on the offensive line. If they have to trot out the kind of left to right of backups, then they get into some real trouble, and you look, you start to look like they did a season ago where – the offensive line was just prohibitively bad. You know, Case Keenum played well last week, but you can't win with an offensive line that bad. Case Keenum had a really weird game last week where he did take six sacks after weeks of us ta- talking about how well he avoids sacks. But it was six sacks that easily could have been 10 or 11 yeah. the way he was under pressure. So it wasn't that bad. And it seemed like all of his best throws were incompletions, whether it was he threw under Rudolph up the seam that was dropped. He had a great pass to Adam Thielen back at the end zone that he just couldn't haul in. Uh, so I think you know Keenum threw the ball pretty well last week, uh, and you know had a little bit of bad luck in there too. So I think we're all taking Minnesota across the board. Yep. Here at PFF, and uh, again Minnesota just right in the mix in the NFC as you know potentially the the best team over there. Big game for them though. They they can't slip up in this game. Right. Uh, and, and Cincinnati is dangerous if yeah. they do come to play. Uh, Tennessee is traveling to San Francisco. Jimmy Garoppolo, 2-0 as a member of the San Francisco 49ers. 
Uh, Tennessee Titans coming off a really tough loss against the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, Marcus Mariota was supposedly banged up a little bit early in that game. It was one of his worst performances of the season. He's a guy who generally has been uh, grading a little bit better than his stats would show. Uh, Mike Renner, though he is unable to speak in his state right now, has was just tweeting. He was just on the Twitter machine talking about Mariota's turnover-worthy plays. He actually has fewer turnover-worthy plays than he has interceptions. And again, it's because not every interception counts as a turnover-worthy play. We're just talking about plays that should be intercepted. He's had some bad interception luck, and even last week he had one miscommunication over the middle of the field that led to a turnover. How we see in this game, because Tennessee still very much in that AFC playoff picture. They are, um, and it's an interesting stylistic matchup because they, at their heart, want to run the ball with power football, with that run uh, the road grading offensive line and just overwhelm teams. And when they've been at their best this year, they've done that. They did it to the Seahawks. Um, the, the 49ers have kind of a collection of penetrating three technique type defensive linemen, guys like DeForest Buckner, who's been really good this season. If there's an area of weakness for him, it's still going up against powerful mauling offensive linemen that can just drive him off the line of scrimmage. I'm interested to see if that defensive front can hold up against that Tennessee offensive line when they come to work and just try and move them. Um, I think they're better equipped now than they were before because even with a guy like Buckner moving backwards off the line, they now have guys like Reuben Foster oh man, he's so good. who can fill those holes a lot better than the linebackers they used to have and make up for it, You know, hide the fact that those guys are getting driven out of the line. Um, and then on the other side of the ball comes down to game three of the, the Jimmy Garoppolo thing. So first off, I'm loving watching some of this young talent come together on the San Francisco defense. The DeForest Buckner thing, I, you guys might not be watching just for some power double teams in this game. I might tune in just to watch double teams against Buckner. That was a, the exact scouting report that we wrote up a couple years ago coming out of the draft. If you run right at him, power football, you can move him. If you run away from him, though, he is very disruptive in the run game. And Reuben Foster already showing he could be one of the game's best linebackers. Uh, the Garoppolo thing, he's been pretty much as hoped, I guess would be the, the way to put it, for San Francisco, handling pressure really well. Some of the passes that he's gotten off with pressure like directly in his face have been ridiculous, like just whipping one sidearm around a guy and you know throwing very, very efficiently over the middle of the field. Uh, so, uh, again, my big thing with Garoppolo, uh, he's, only, he's only really – uh, uh, attempted a handful of passes outside the numbers uh, beyond 10 yards. And to me, that is going to be uh, the big question for him and his career. Uh, I think he works in the middle of the field really well. He can make good decisions. How much can he challenge outside the numbers? I think that's the thing to look out for. I think they're reaching the point, though, where they could be pretty excited about his future. Oh, yeah. I think I think there's absolutely room for, room for optimism. Uh, I've compared him to... Uh, Matt Hasselbeck in, in the past, as far as it, it, more like peak Matt Hasselbeck, a guy that you can win with that's going to, you know, sneak up into the top 10 quarterbacks in a given season. I think Garoppolo has, has shown something like that. Is that is that fair at this point? Is that underestimating Garoppolo? Um, I think it's definitely fair, and it may also be underestimating. It might I think, be a little I think bit of both. The ceiling bit is uh, still to be determined. You know, so far we're still working from low sample sizes. I haven't actually checked where he stands in relation to C.J. Beathard in terms of total snaps, but he can't be much. For, you know, he can't have passed him by much if he has yet. Um, in terms of career NFL snaps, so we're it's still, still dealing. Early. Yeah, we're still dealing with really small sample size stuff, but everything we've seen has looked pretty good. Um, so I think, yeah, he, he stylistically, that's not a bad comp. He may be a little bit more athletic than Matt Hasselbeck, though Hasselbeck was, as they like to say, sneaky athletic. He had a bit of bit of moves to him in his in his peak. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't hate that comp. Uh, uh, did you know that Jimmy Garoppolo has more Super Bowl rings than Christian Hackenberg has snaps of football in the um, NFL? Yes. Okay, that's not a bad. That's not a good trivia question at no. all. Uh, but it's true. Anyway, who are you taking in this one? We have Tennessee, who's very much in the AFC playoff picture, and San Francisco, who's very much in the <laughs> top five overall draft picture. And yet I'm picking the 49ers. Yeah, they're trending that way. I'm taking them as well. Everyone except Mike Renner and Gordon McGinnis and Nathan the Yankee, they're all taking Tennessee. So uh, we're all taking, I guess, what you would consider the underdog. But with Jimmy G at the helm, they're undefeated. So it is kind of a different San Francisco team 
going out there against Tennessee. Uh, big game for the Titans. All right, Arizona going to travel to Washington to take the Redskins, both teams, uh, out of the playoff picture in the deep NFC. Uh, I think this is still your Kirk Cousins audition tape, even though I think he's. I think there's been enough tape out there to figure out what Kirk Cousins is. <laughs> Have you managed it yet? You seem to be perpetually on the on the fence with Kirk Cousins. No, I. Well, look, it, it's <laughs> tough because you got to you got to pay him top five money versus he's probably a top fifteen guy. I think that's yeah. that's the crux of this whole thing. But honestly, that's Matthew Stafford, right? Matthew Stafford, it's, a guy that's been paid top five money, and it depends on when you get paid, Matthew Stafford, but he's a top 10 to 15 guy. It's Alex Smith. It's, it's the same thing you come up with all these quarterbacks that aren't the new Aaron Rodgers. Is he good enough to win? Yes. Are we stuck paying him the $100 million contract because that's what you have to pay a quarterback? Yes. I mean, it's, just, it's just a bad situation to be in, but you have to bite the bullet. And if you're Washington, you're probably, you're, you're probably fully entrenched in the draft class. You're probably eyeballing the guys like Alex Smith that are going to be on the market and Tyrod Taylors and Teddy Bridgewaters and whoever's going to be out there on the market. But at some point, you got to make a decision and say, Kirk Cousins might be better than all those guys. Or even if I'm enamored with a guy in the draft, I'm not really in position to get the top guy. Plus, they've already been paying him a ton of money just by franchising the guy constantly. So, you know, just <laughs> give him the long-term deal. Just lock him up. Meanwhile, Arizona's thinking about... Blaine Gabbert in their future. I think there are other guys that could probably do a better job than Blaine, but what are we looking for in this game? I feel like Arizona's defense started to come together, and uh, they're, they're starting to become the defense that I was uh, very intrigued by before the season, but they just season went off the rails, and you kind of lost track of them a little bit. Yeah, Tremont Williams has turned back the clock and looks like the guy that was a really good cornerback, coverage corner for the, the Green Bay Packers a few years ago um, before his career looked like it was done, but he's now become that second starting corner opposite Patrick Peterson that can actually hold his own and doesn't just become the guy that gets the sheer every target because nobody wants to put the ball near Patrick Peterson. Um, now teams actually have to respect both sides of the, of the ball against Arizona. This past week against Tennessee, Tremont Williams saw eight passes go his way. Patrick Peterson saw seven. So teams are actually now throwing the ball back at Patrick Peterson because Tremont Williams is having such a good run. Yeah, it's it's really an important deal for, for Arizona. Them and, uh, I'd say, the Chiefs are the two teams that we said really need that number two cornerback to uh, to lock things down opposite their stars, and that is uh, something to keep an eye on down the stretch here. Arizona has not pressured the quarterback well at all, and I think we mentioned that earlier in the year. When you lose Calais Campbell, all of a sudden the Jaguars have this killer pass rush and the Cardinals do not. They lost uh, their top guy. Larry Fitz still dominating, just being awesome. Leading the league in slot yardage, 667 yards Up to from third the slot. all time in receiving yardage. Passed Randy Moss last week. Uh, got a ways to go. Well, a little bit of ways to go before he passes T.O. for number two. He's another 600 yards odd. And then another 10 years of production to get yeah, Jerry Rice. Yeah, exactly. And another like 7,000 before he hits Jerry Rice's mark. And then uh, don't forget Corey Davis, hot on his heels. Absolutely. Only, uh, you know. 26 yards last week, I believe it was, to uh, move perfect. him even closer. Yeah. Uh, if you want to dig up Corey Davis's all-time ranking while we're going through the next game. I don't, don't have be, that kind of time. Don't be afraid. Who you got in this one, Sam? Arizona at, at Washington. Uh, Washington. Yes. Also taking Washington here. All right. Let's move on. Another game. Dallas traveling to Oakland. Dallas is a lot like Green Bay. Uh very much alive in the playoff picture. Uh, it's one of those things where you're alive and you can do everything you can. You can win out and all that fun stuff, but you still need some help because every team seems still seems to be good in the NFC. I do need to uh, study up on the ridiculous playoff scenarios. I do know the Browns are eliminated at this point. Is that official? <laughs> I think so, yeah. All right, I think I have that part down. But look, Dallas uh, still sit, now sitting at 7-6. Uh, and six. If they win out, they can at least make things interesting. What are we seeing here, Dallas and Oakland? Yeah, I, I think last week was a kind of a big watershed moment for the Raiders in terms of throwing a torpedo into their season once and for all. I think it was a big statement that they just weren't able to live with the Chiefs at all. Derek Carr has come out and said that he's finally going to start unleashing the ball down the field because the coaching staff really wants it now. They want him to show it, which kind of begs the question of what on earth they've been doing for the rest of the season, that this is... It's like a priority at this point. Now, now it's almost gone. I don't even know why. They made the offensive coordinator change before this offseason. And if you look at Carr's career, he had 
a subpar rookie season, which is fine. He showed growth his second year, growth in his third year, and then there's an offensive coordinator change. And I just thought things should have been trending up for him, and I don't understand why there is such a conservative nature there. Yeah, it's it's tough. I think he's played worse. The receivers around him have been worse and banged up. You know, they've had to go deep into the bench at times. It's just, it's not looked good. If anything, the offensive line has been better than a year ago when it was one of the best units in the league. It's allowed just a ridiculous level of pressure. Hardly anything gets to him. The ball gets out quickly. And they I mean, just, they're aided a little bit by the quick game. Yeah, but. but they're just not taking advantage of that by actually scheming some relatively long developing stuff, anything that requires a bit of... Um, patience and distance to to achieve. It's it's just it's depressing, is what it is. You dropped a Ro- Rodney Hudson stat on me t- uh, the other day when we were writing <laughs> yeah. him up. Just one hurry all season. That's one it. total pressure all season long. He's about to go if he makes it the rest of the season. He'll have gone two full seasons without allowing either a sack or a hit on the quarterback. Yeah, that's impressive. So I, I was just on uh, Buffalo radio actually, and they just randomly asked me, "Hey, give me a disappointing team so far in the NFL." I had to say Oakland because I think yeah. we were talking about them as Super Bowl contenders and knowing that the defense had to take a step forward, but thinking, hey, they've got some youth and some pieces in place, and if anything, it's worked the other way. Uh, what about Dallas here? You know, Dak Prescott went through uh, a bit of a slump. I think he looked a lot better last week against the New York Giants, and you know they're just trying to uh, hold the fort here. And they were trying to hold the fort, and they did. You know, they're still in striking distance here. Are there enough pieces for them to to win out because that's what they need to do? I think there probably are. This it's a talented team. I I just don't know. I don't for a start. I don't know if they can do it, and I don't even know if that's going to be good enough. Even if they can, um, the NFC is still a pretty tough race to be chasing. Really, for that final um, wild card spot, which is a win ahead of them, and there's a bunch of teams positioned to do that. The Seahawks are also a game ahead of them, and they're not even in the playoff seeds as, as things currently stand. So, yeah, I think Dallas can win, certainly win this game and potentially win out. I just don't know if even that's going to be good enough. All right, I think most people at PFF are taking Dallas. Is that right? Everybody except Nathan taking Dallas. Are, are we ready to completely write off the Raiders? Yeah. All right, we're taking Dallas. We're writing off the Raiders. You know the way it's important, I think, it's important to let the people know this. You know, 30 of 32 NFL teams are currently PFF customers? Correct. Both the teams that aren't eliminated from playoff contention. Oh, man. We can't say who they are. You can't say who they are. can't say who they are, but we can tell you that neither of them are in playoff contention at the moment. So we are going to win a ring? Yes. All right. That's good to know. Another ring. I mean, we've won rings before. Oh, I know. We have. I'm still waiting for mine to arrive, but we, you know, we're getting another ring. It is good to... Which is uh, really just adding to our Hall of Fame credentials. You know, eventually, <laughs> um, eventually we're going to be there, presumably. Almost up to Brady. Yeah. The five rings. What, when will PFF get there? Do we go in collectively or individually? Do we have to wait, you know? You wouldn't get in individually, Sam. What if I retire before you do? No. Well, will you retire as a member of PFF? What if you go somewhere else? Would you come back and sign a one-day contract with us? I don't think you need to. I think you can kind of declare who you want to who you want to go into the hall as. I was just wondering. You know, you your can... longest tenure kind of deal. Who you're most remembered for. If I do go to work for someone else, mm-hmm. some other te- uh, entity or whatever it is, I would always hope to come back to PFF for, for the at one least contract. the one-day contract. Maybe two days. I don't know if you want to put that kind of workload in, in on Mark's desk. Our controller. I don't think he wants that. the hassle of that one-day contract. Mark's a good controller. He can handle that. Quick break to tell you that this episode is brought to you by PredictionMachine.com. Prediction Machine, a new generation in sports analytics where they play the game 50,000 times before they're actually played. Make better picks with proven data-driven analysis. Subscribe at PredictionMachine.com today and earn a $5 credit that can be used towards the purchase of any package. I do enjoy Prediction Machine. Those guys do a nice job. And now it's time to go to our friends again. It's George Chirur and Eric Eager. They're going to give you our pick of the week. It is week 15. Three weeks remain. Lock of the week. Somehow, some way, we still have a winning record, despite the atrocity that happened this past week. Um, Eric, over there in Wisconsin. I'm George. Uh, Eric, it snowed here in D.C. this week. It's like 20 million degrees below zero so i feel sort of like i'm a kindred spirit with you being up there in the cold uh, north 
Yeah, and you know, this week I wore a jacket for the first time all all uh, you know fall semester. So yeah, it, it was rough. I mean, um, my family was going through a flu, and I think my immune system hung on just long enough until like Seattle gave up that game, and then it just gave way. And so yeah, it's been a rough few days, but um, we'll rebound. Yeah, I punished myself uh, by not allowing myself to wear a jacket. So. Um, I'm now frostbitten. In a Seems couple fair. Places. Yeah, but I've learned my lesson, right? The lesson, of course, don't bet against Blake Bortles. Um, seems Actually, like that's bad. probably not the lesson to learn from this one. Are you sure? Because I, I don't know. I, I've been following, uh, you know, some of these, you know, sharp guys out there, and they keep throwing out trends. And you know, we're you know, 0 and 2, 2 against Blake Bortles. Blake Bortles. It's a trend. We are 0-2 against Blake Bortles. That is true. And and also another trend that we saw, I think we even gave it to uh, Blake Bortles' facts. You're welcome, by the way. Um, Blake Bortles has never picked a game incorrectly against the spread um, in his life. So he's got that on us, too. I don't even know where to go from there. That <laughs> That's like 15 minutes too long on the Blake Bortles topic. This week, though, uncharted territory. So we're 10-4. and 4. Um, which, you know, it's whatever, it's fine. But we need to get back on the winning track. And to do so, we're going to step away from a spread pick and go to an over-under and also go away from a Sunday game and go to Saturday because everyone loves Saturday. And now we have two games on Saturday, and the one we are heading to is uh, Detroit-Chicago. Uh, the great Kurt Warner, by the way, is calling this game. And if you know anything about Kurt Warner, points will be scored. And we are betting on that exact thing to happen. Over, uh, under, currently is at 44. We have it sailing over that. I feel really good about this one. So, to prepare for the worst, Eric, what's, uh, what's going wrong in this one, if anything does? Yeah, I mean, Chicago's got a good defense. They're fifth in our rating system. Um, and, you know, so there is a chance that they could shut down Detroit's offense. Um, they also play kind of a a pretty like slow paced offensive uh, attack with kind of, you know, <clears throat> keeping their quarterback under wraps a little bit and running the football a lot. And so if you get a lot, a lot of long drives that only result in field goals or turnovers or something that we could see this actually go under. On the other hand, I, you know, as you talked to me before, we, we sort of recorded this, you know, it is the, the worst offense, which is Chicago is playing the worst defense, which is Detroit 28th in our, in our rating system. So, I think we see this going a different way, though. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. And I mean, Chicago, for all of their ineptitude offensively, made opportunities all that often, just 27 drives into the red zone, which is last in the NFL. But when they get there, they are scoring touchdowns. And the great Mitchell Trubisky, the lobster Trubisk, has put himself in, in a position to continue ascending Last week was by far his best uh, game of the season, best game of his career. Um, and now he gets a Detroit Lions defense, which hasn't exactly pressured the quarterback. Uh, I think they're, you know, like 29th or something in, in pressure rate. And that's tr- that's been Trubisky's big bugaboo this year, right? He's completing 40% of his passes when he's under pressure, 65% of his passes when he's from a clean pocket. So, um sets up well for him to sort of continue that, as we say, taking the next step. Right. And so Detroit's defense is, you know, fifth is giving up the fifth most yards per play uh, um, in the NFL uh, tied with a few other teams, kind of similarly poor, um, you know, against the pass and similarly poor against the run. So, you know, they're playing an indoor game, which always helps. Um, both kicker, you know, the, the both kickers should be able to make field goals, especially Matt Prater, who's been fantastic this year. Um, both special teams groups um, with three Cohen um, and, you know, Detroit Lions with uh, Agnew has had a couple touchdowns uh, in returns. You know, I think, you know, there there's going to be opportunities for um, points to be scored, short fields to be had. And, you know, Detroit in their 13 games has, has only gone under 40 uh, 45 points three times. Um, and, you know, the last time that Detroit played Chicago, it ended up at about 51 points. So, you know, while there is always an opportunity for, for us to be wrong, I think in terms of looking at the swath of games this week, this is the best bet 
so far. There is an opportunity for us to be wrong. Cold hard facts brought to you by uh, Coors Light. Blake Bortles. Oh, or actually, I could see Blake Bortles delivering cold hard facts brought to you by Coors Light. That seems like something that he would do. Um, You're welcome, Blake. It seems like I don't like Blake Bortles. I'm just really bitter because I wish I had picked with Blake Bortles and could be excited about that because I want him to do well. But it makes sense a lot of the time to bet against him, and being on the short end of the stick is just terrible. feels awful. It's a really low feeling. Anyways. Uh, the one other thing that, that we should mention, in, a, in addition to uh, liking the, the over... Our model also likes uh, Chicago here. We're not quite as stoked on that. That's why it's not our lock of the week. But um, a certain friend of ours, uh, the one and only Gordon McGinnis, the uh, the master of the parlay. Yeah, there's um, no paucity of parlays in Gordon's uh, portfolio of uh, sports betting. Yeah, the prime minister of the parlay. He uh, will enjoy taking the over and Chicago uh, getting five and a half points. Um, you may as well. So a little added bonus there. Of course, if you want all of the picks and you want to, you know, orchestrate your own parlays, head to uh, the website, profootballfocus.com. Our five pick column uh, will be out. And if for some unknown reason you have not gotten an elite subscription, do so immediately. That gets you all the spread picks, all of the against the spread picks, um, uh, sorry, and over unders, and uh, you know many winnings coming your way. It's it's Christmas. The playoffs are coming. Just make it happen. All right, uh, Eric. Anything else? Any last words? Uh, good luck, Mike. Lock it up. That's the right one. Lock it up is correct. I don't know where this good luck, Mike, is coming from. But anyways, see you guys. All right, thanks, guys. Fantastic work at, as usual. Don't forget to get to profootballfocus.com. You guys can check out all of the picks. Are they all with uh, all as part of Elite, right, Sam? Yeah, make yourself some money with the Elite package. You get all of the PFF uh, analytics picks each week. Yeah, their top five picks have been just outstanding all, all, all year. So. You get against the spread and you get the over-under. Yeah, so go ahead and uh, check that out. All right, next game to discuss, we've got the Green Bay Packers traveling to the Carolina Panthers. Aaron Rodgers is back and healthy-ish. Can they go on this run? Can they go on the run? Can they do what we just were asking, you know, can Dallas do it? Can they go undefeated, finish a 10-6, and six, and at least potentially earn a payoff? Play healthy-ish. Is this going to be the game like, hey, this was against Carolina as well, wasn't it, where Tony Romo came back, lasted about, half a game and then broke himself again and was done. I, I feel like the broken collarbone and then the chronic back injury are a little bit different. Romo had a back injury where it was like, please don't hit him. Please don't hit him. Whereas Rogers, I assume once he's cleared, they're like, all right, that's a healthy bone that shouldn't break easier than it did, you know, and than any other bone. Yeah. Like, that's, that's my assumption. Okay. But I'm no, uh, I'm no doctor. I'm just saying there is, um, there is, omens of history repeating itself shadows forewarnings whatever um rogers is back the packers did it they stayed alive until aaron Rodgers got back enough to lead the team that's all we asked him but he's important he's he asked said that he's not back to save the team he's just back to play quarterback just here to play football for a team that happens to need saving yeah. um weirdly he might be walking back into a position that's actually better than the one he left because while he's been gone the packers have found a running game in um, Aaron Jones and uh, Williams, Jamal Williams. Jamal Williams, BYU, the rookies. Yes, pair of rookies, both of whom have been running really well. And actually, poor old Ty Montgomery, having kind of won that job himself last year, <laughs> may, have, may have lost it again through getting injured this season because that they now have a stable of running backs that all look pretty capable. Um, but that Packers offense has always looked so much more dangerous when they have a viable running game uh, behind Aaron Rodgers. And now they do. I this is going to be fun. I'm I'm really excited to see what he can do straight fresh off the the injury um, bench and, and with that more powerful running game behind him. Yeah, Jones wasn't great last week. Probably disappointing a few of his fantasy owners as well. But he's at least flashed uh, some of that big play potential. And again, that's I think when they drafted those guys, that was our analysis there too. And coming into the off season. or coming into the season last off season, it was like all right, they added a couple running backs, they added Martellus Bennett. They still have all those wide receivers. 
Uh, the other thing to keep an eye on, though, of course, Bennett is gone. And uh, my point was uh, some of those things didn't come true early in the year when Rodgers was there, but it might be starting to take shape. We've also seen Devontae Adams uh, really step up as the number one receiver there yeah. for Green Bay and Jordy Nelson, you know, maybe looking like he's on the decline. But I'll tell you what, the it, you know, Brett Hundley's not going to get the best out of Jordy Nelson, but Aaron Rodgers can. The back shoulder stuff, a lot of the things that they do, short game and uh, the, just some of the feel passes that those guys have, we should see a little bit better production out of Jordy. The screen game's been really good for Green Bay mm-hmm. uh, while uh, Rodgers has been gone as well. So uh, something to keep an eye on. Look, Carolina is another team that is really tough to figure out because I think we see the holes. Uh, a lot of the holes were when Luke Keekley was not there on the defensive side of the ball. When he's there, it's a completely different defense. Cam Newton's inconsistency is maddening. Yeah. But they're still sitting there atop the AFC South at 9-4. and four. They're still good. They're still talented. Um, a lot of last week was being able to just completely rip into that Minnesota Vikings offensive line, the injuries they had. You know, Mario Addison had an absolutely monstrous game, had a sack and seven hurries. I mentioned on the review, they schemed him up really well. They got him isolated on uh, Searles, Jeremy, uh, Jeremiah Searles. At guard, it was just a, a mismatch. Great job schematically by the Panthers. Um, five hurries from Wes Horton. They just had a huge amount of pressure from those guys. So I, for a start, the Packers have a far better pass-blocking offensive line than the Vikings do to begin with, plus they're healthy. You know, those, Going up against David Bakhtiari, you can basically rely on that side being shut down. You know, He just doesn't give up a huge amount of pressure at all. The rest of that line's pretty good as well. So I would expect a pretty significant step backwards from the Carolina defense, and then it's a case of whether that offense can get anything going or get into a groove against uh, the Packers' D. Yeah, let's keep an eye on, I think, you know, the interior receivers. So it's, you know, Randall Cobb. You can get those guys isolated on Mike Adams, Kurt Coleman, the safeties for the uh, Panthers. I think that actually might be where Rodgers is able to find mismatches. So I think that's what I'll be keeping an eye on. Uh, I think when we picked these games, were you aware of Rodgers being back or not? Yes. You were. And who did you go with knowing that Aaron Rodgers was coming back? The Panthers. You took the Panthers despite Rodgers coming back, so he's not gonna. He's not gonna save them. He's not gonna run the table. They're gonna have, they're gonna make it all the way to just staying alive until Rodgers is back, and then he's gonna lose the first game. So it didn't matter. He's not here to save them. I also took Carolina. I do think the the home matchup, Carolina coming off that impressive win uh, against the Minnesota Vikings. I'm taking the Panthers as well. Mike Renner is the only guy taking the Packers. All right, Chicago Bears going up against the Detroit Lions. Uh, Bears with uh, the unleashed Mitch Trubisky coming off his best game. We did chalk some of that up, of course, to the uh, poor Cincinnati defense. Tap out. But the Lions, they're in the same situation as the Cowboys and the Packers. They're sitting at 7-6. and six. They need to win out as well. And they're going to be playing the Packers last week of the season. Can the Lions do it, Sam? So the, for the first time ever, people can't accuse us of hating the Lions because unanimous PFF picks have gone for Detroit over Chicago, despite the Bears just whooping up on the Bengals. Well, it's not the Bengals they're playing this week. It's Detroit. Exactly. We're taking the Lions. All of us. There you go. Some Lions love for the first time ever. Um, We've been very fair to the Lions. Fair, yes, but not kind. I I think think, that's their point. That's a fair way of putting it. Yeah. Um, it's, It's really tough to isolate what the Bears did last week from the utter capitulation of the Bengals. Um, The one kind of good aspect of all that that I think is a bit independent of that is that they they took the training wheels off uh, Mitch Trubisky a bit. They let him they let him act like a quarterback instead of a guy they desperately don't want to lose the game for them. Let him throw more than 15 times. Exactly, nice. yeah. Let him throw the ball. Let him air it out a little bit. Let him actually play quarterback and see what he can do, given that it's not like we're going anywhere this season anyway. Um, and he looked far better doing that. And you got to see, because of that, a better run game because teams weren't just stacking the line with all the bodies. They were respecting the pass game. Um, the offensive line looked back to the unit we thought it would look like when we rolled into this season. Charles Leno at left tackle made team of the week. Cody Whitehair at center made team of the week. Um, that offensive line looked formidable. So I think that part could potentially be replicated against the Lions this week, at least in terms of being more dangerous than it's been in the past. Um, and then we get to see what the Lions can do against that Chicago defense, where it's been a much better unit than we expected this season. And 
a huge amount of that has been the secondary guys that we really didn't expect to be playing well guys like kyle fuller had a monster game last week um, and it's really starting to ask kind of awkward questions for the bears in terms of what they're going to do with him going forward do they re-sign him now after this right. season having basically written him off heading into this year with eddie jackson at safety adrian amos at safety it is shaping up to be a you know a pretty nice young secondary yeah. depending on what they do with fuller uh, I'll be looking at Detroit's defense and you know early in the season they were overachieving and they had players that we were on the show continuing to say hey look at these guys overachieving Anthony Zettel and uh, Quandre Diggs and those guys have uh, crept back toward average Sam crept back toward what that we expected them to, them to be uh, Zettel was a house of fire early in the season rushing the passer he only has two games with more than two pressures since week four so hey, house of fire house of fire right wow no? what's that uh, that's is this like um, you've just made up, or is this actually a thing? I think it's a thing. If imagine fire coming off the edge, it's okay. tough to block. It would be, yeah. Unless so, you were made of like you had those uh, oven mitts, then you'd probably be okay. I don't think that would slow you down that much. Oven mitts? It just delays the burn significantly. I mean, it's a fire, not a not a hot dish, Sam. Okay, <laughs> the well, fire well, will get through the oven mitts. What if they're like asbestos lined oven mitts? I think what's going to happen if he's a house of fire, he's going to have a seven sack, uh, seven pressure game against Arizona, an eight pressure game against Minnesota. That's what he was doing early in the season. Okay, he hasn't been doing that in recent weeks. He hasn't, and they don't have another pass rusher uh, that has uh, you know stepped up and played at that level. That has been a big issue for Detroit. It puts a lot of pressure on their secondary, which has been opportunistic with the turnovers. You know, Jameis Winston and Jameis just looked like he just mailed it in last week too. Just. Just chucking. You're just smiling. Like, of course. <laughs> of course. He's just chucking passes. <laughs> it doesn't matter. any day now. Still only 23. Yeah. 20, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start deducting from his age. He's only 19, Sam. He, he's going to learn. He's going to get better. Out. Uh, but yeah, I'm taking Detroit in this one too. They're at home. And uh, they really, really need it. And uh, But I am looking forward to watching Trubisky and watching him try to build on last week's performance. I hope they do that again. I hope that's their approach the rest of the season is that they're going to let Trubisky be a quarterback how are you going to question my house of fire i'm just i've never heard that before we all have detroit all right next game miami going to buffalo what do you got in this one um well miami, can miami build off of this monday night football fresh game? off delivering an ass kick into the new england patriots which of course everybody saw coming and i think that's why so the reason why buffalo radio called me is they were fascinated by the fact that eight of nine PFF analysts <laughs> chose Buffalo over Miami. Gordon McGinnis being the only one that chose Miami. Our analytics team is also giving Buffalo the slight edge when it comes to the numbers. Both of these teams are still in the playoff hunt. I mean, this division was not supposed to be that. It was supposed to be the Patriots, which it is, and then everyone else was supposed to be terrible. The, like, they're all okay. The, the Bills are 7-6, and six, the Dolphins are 6-7, and seven, and even the Jets are 5-7. and seven. They're, all, they're all okay record-wise. Yeah. Look, Miami across the board has not been a good team. It hasn't been bad, though, which is kind of the point. They played a fantastic game on Monday night. When you talk about their uh, game planning, they were, they were throwing a lot of five-man pressures at Brady, playing man coverage. They're not really a man coverage team, mm. and they were playing tight man coverage on the back end. They did a great job. It actually reminded me of the Houston Texans. They gave Brady and the Patriots a little bit of trouble last year in the playoffs. Very good game plan execution. Xavier uh, Howard, I posted your scouting report from uh, two years ago in the draft, and you and I were watching a ton of film on him, and I think you first pointed out to me, like, watch his good plays and then watch his bad plays. And it is like watching a Pop Warner guy versus Richard Sherman. Yeah. One day, one one play, it's terrible. One play, it's elite Pro Bowl type of play. And Xavier Howard has been on that Pro Bowl end of the spectrum the last two weeks. He's been outstanding. That's what makes Miami so maddening is that inconsistency. Last three weeks, two of which came against three the weeks. Patriots. Um, over that time, three weeks, 17 targets, two receptions he's given up. From 17 targets, 30 yards, no touchdowns, four picks, four pass breakups, a passer rating when targeted of zero. Incredible. That's like obscene. Yeah, and that's exactly Against what we said Tom during the Brady draft. twice. We put a third, I think it was a third round grade on him, and we said there's some risk here, but the, uh, the upside is immense. Like if you can get this top end play out of him, it's well worth it. And that's where we are. I don't know if he could sustain it. But that is worth watching alone because that completely changes the Miami defense if he can keep that up. Yeah, he's been phenomenal. Um, who's the Who's the playmaker on the other side, though, Sam, for Miami on the offense? Kenyon Drake. Yes, that's Kenyon your other Drake. boy. 
I made what may be an ill-advised tweet during, was it the national championship game? During one of Alabama's big games. It might have been right during the Heisman ceremony or something. No, it was definitely during a game because okay. he did something in the game to it was make like a, me say One of the big it. kick returns or something. Could have been, yeah. Um, I said that during the hype when Derrick Henry was rushing for like a million yards off seven million carries um, and was getting all the Heisman hype that season, I made the outlandish claim that Kenyon Drake would prove to be a better pro running back than Derrick Henry. Now, up until this point, that's Did you looked, retweet yourself on that recently? Not yet. Trying to dig that not up? Not yet. I, I might dig it up. He's hot right now. No, no, no. We've got to hold it for a while. I'm retweeting it. Holding it for a while. Up until a few weeks ago, that looked ridiculous. It's starting to look a little bit, you know, a little bit closer. He's changed their offense, man. Look, Jay Ajayi did what he could behind that bad offensive line. Jay Ajayi is a really good running back, but he's very one-dimensional. Right. But Drake, Drake is now taking plays where maybe there's nothing and finding room. There were plays where he was bottled up, and before you know it, it's 20. And then he's a good receiver. Yes. I mean, he is, an, he is a legit... He's not Alvin Kamara, but man, he has added that level of playmaking he's that kind to the of Miami style. offense. I mean, he's not style, he's yeah. not as good as Kamara, but he's definitely that kind of style back. In that he's that's why I really liked him in that capacity because he is that complete running back in a way that the, the league is trending now towards these guys, the guys that can line up as a receiver, that can catch the pa- catch the ball seamlessly and make things happen immediately after the catch as opposed to just be a force in the backfield and then occasionally take a dump off that's not going to go anywhere anyway. Yeah, um, so they, they're they using him in those creative ways. Yeah, and it's working. So why are we all taking Buffalo? I, I mean, Personally, I think they're a little bit cleaner team when Tyrod's running, running the show yes. than Peterman. That's big. And even though their run defense has been gashed at times, I worry about Miami's consistency. Cutler coming back. I just think Miami went and played their Super Bowl Monday night yeah. against the Patriots. I worry about them coming back, another uh, trip to Buffalo and maintaining that level of performance. No, I agree. I think that was um, Miami's best game of the season. I just don't know how likely they are to repeat that. A big thing with them is always Cutler. What are you going to get out of him? Is he going to go back in the tank and make some big mistakes? Yeah, right. Um, one of my favorite, you know, every now and again, Microsoft Word will throw you a, an autocorrect that, on, on a name usually. Cause right. I, I can't remember, whatever I wrote last week, like 5,000 words, which I just go and teach it about 57 new player names. So it stopped telling me they were wrong. Humble brag, 5,000 <laughs> words. <laughs> that was just that was just the morning. Um, one day, one name that it tried to autocorrect for me was Tredavious White, and it tried to correct that to Predacious White. And to be honest, I was inclined to let it. I, I think, like that. I think that name. should be a new nickname. Let's call him Predacious. Predacious White. What's In, the definition it, of Predacious? You know, predacious. of predator. Predatory predatory type person i don't know what the i should google sorry it. i put the you official on the webster let me definition. buy some time while you uh google predacious but tredavious white was our number two cornerback on the draft board last year sam oh you got it of animal of an animal predatory is the adjective oh i should have known there that. you go i mean it's yeah more or less that's a more official way of me trying to bumble my way to tredavious predacious white predacious white he's been really good look the secondary overall has been good uh, if they could tie things up and slow down Drake in the run game, I think Buffalo's got a good chance. Can't slow down Drake. Not right. possible. We're taking Buffalo 8 out of 9. I think there was a reason for it, and the analytics like them as well, as long as Tyrod does start at quarterback. All right, the Philadelphia Eagles traveling to the New York Giants. It's the Nick Foles show in Philadelphia. Again, my apologies to all Eagles fans for Carson Wentz and the injury. Do the Eagles have a shot with Nick Foles, Sam? Pour one out for, uh, for Carson. Um. I, I think they do. We we talked about this before on the, the review podcast coming out of the weekend after the injury. Um, I think the Eagles do things that will play to Nick Foles' strengths. Whether Nick Foles has enough strengths for that to matter is perhaps uh, uh, up for debate. But they do have this phenomenal defensive front, which is a huge thing. They have a good um, group in the secondary. I think our, our man Austin Gale there pulled out a number that the Eagles have 33 more pressures than any other team in the NFL on defense sounds right they're rolling seven deep on that defensive line of legit talent i mean that's a huge amount of pressure in and out, in and above anybody else in the league you know as to be that far out ahead of anybody else a huge um, amount so they're getting more pressure than anyone else in the league by a distance they got a pretty good coverage unit behind that only getting more healthy sydney jones i think was activated um for the first time having rookie got Ronald, out of washington and their know. their top rookie um the guy that's i, I you know, honestly, before he got hurt, I thought he was the best cornerback in this draft class. 
Yeah, um, I kept mocking him at like 13 to Arizona. So yeah. he, was a, he was a first round talent. So he could make an impact if he's getting back healthy. They got Ronald Darby back already. Um, the defense could carry this team. The offense has been doing an incredible job as well. And I think they're set up with those running backs, with Nick Foles able to, to run this RPO stuff, do the simple reads. Um, well, I think we could we could see them skate by okay. Nelson Aguilar leads the league in in touchdowns from the slot with seven. I think this – Nick Foles is not Carson Wentz, no. but I think this is the, the opportunity for the rest of that roster to just yeah. show how good they are. I think we're all uh, sticking with the Eagles, right? It's not it's not disaster time for Philadelphia it's just, just yet. It's a different focus. Like they're back from having – they're they've gone from having a quarterback that they could realistically expect or hope to lead them to a Super Bowl – to a quarterback that they can now win a Super Bowl with, assuming everybody else does well. You know, everyone else leads them there. So he's, the quarterback has just gone from being the guy that's leading the team to being the guy that's being led by the team, but can still, I think, get there. The same, I think they can still get to the same point. I think it's a fair point. I think it's a fair breakdown of the Eagles. Do not lose hope, Eagles fans. All right, another really nice game NFC West battle, Los Angeles Rams at the Seattle Seahawks. The Rams still one game up on Seattle in the NFC West. I think we've all just kind of assumed that the Seahawks would eventually overtake the Rams and win the NFC West. Is this the week? Did they just win it? And both teams are sitting here at 9-5 and five after this week. Yes. Um, the Seahawks are at home, which is always a huge, sway, a huge thing swaying whether they win or lose. Um, I think last week, even though they got rolled by the Jags, I think it was actually a, not a terrible sign for them because they went on the road against a really good team and Russell Wilson had one of those games where he starts putting the ball up and you think, what on earth are you doing um, that he tends to have every now and again? And still, they were relatively close in that game. So if you take those things away and you say, right, now they're, on the, they're at home instead of on the road, and presumably Russell Wilson isn't going to have another one of those games back-to-back, that makes them a lot harder to beat. I, th- at that point, I think they're every bit the match of the Rams and should beat them. Yeah, so this was one of those games, Jared Goff coming out, people were questioning his hand size and these things that might not matter. Why are they going to hate the guy with the small hands? Well, people said, what about when he goes to Seattle in December and it's raining and I don't know what the weather report is, but you know, maybe this is one of those games where he has to step up and and be the guy. And Goff has uh, Goff got away with a lot last week against yeah. the Eagles, uh, some poor red zone decisions. The stats ended up pretty good. Zach and I broke him down briefly on the QB podcast. I, I want to see Goff make a make a statement here for for the Rams, uh, and then uh, you know I'm still taking Seattle, but uh, I think I don't think it's as lopsided as I would have thought earlier in the season. So the Seahawks' offensive line has kind of been revamped since they brought Dwayne Brown on board at left tackle. It's made a huge difference to their overall pass protection performance. The big problems though are still inside, and obviously Aaron Donald tends to go off when the Rams play the Seahawks because Aaron Donald is the best interior defender in the league and the Seahawks have one of the worst interior offensive lines in the league but what was it I asked you last week during that game when did Michael Brockers become awesome yeah Michael Brockers has become an absolute force he was 2012 first round pick by the way yeah that's how long ago he's a first round pick and he's just been like a decent player the last few years he was having a huge game this past week um making some absolute dominant plays you know ragdolling guys tossing them aside making plays in the backfield looking like the compliment to aaron donald that the rams have been looking for for a while against the eagles offensive line which is one of the better offensive lines in the nfl those are going up against some very tough guards um, and he was tossing guys like Brandon Brooks aside. So if you've got two guys that can do that to the Seahawks offensive line, that's a problem. Yeah, I think that would be the matchup to watch. You watch Aaron Donald anytime the Rams are on, but uh, Brockers now is uh, also some must-see TV. I think we both like Seattle. I don't think the defense has fallen off as much as people think, despite some of the injuries that they've dealt with. And uh, you know, it feels like one of those games where even if Russell Wilson struggles through it, he'll He'll find that magic at the end, like he always seems to. Yeah. Uh, everybody except who is Mike, it? Mike and Renner, Nathan, and Nathan. Oh, Nathan's way off to the right. I keep missing him. <laughs> Everyone else taking Seattle. Two more games to get through. Baltimore Ravens at the Cleveland Browns. I'm just going to say it right now. I think I'm the only one. I am. You are only one taking the Cleveland Browns. This is the game. Browns are going to win it. Really? Yep. Why? Because uh, they've been a bit of a roller coaster. Mm, Kaiser's yeah. been a bit of well. Kaiser's been a bit of a roller coaster. I think I think we start to trend up now. Uh, Baltimore's offense, I do feel like they've overachieved a little bit. Joe Flacco 
was actually horrendous on Sunday night, despite them scoring 38 points. Well, yeah, Mike Wallace PDs. Oh, my God. It was unbelievable. Do we have them down here? We do. We got, well, no, we didn't add them. Taylor didn't add them. We rewatched the film, and it was just so bad, some of the stuff that he got away with. He's not going to get away with it. I think again. what we're discovering here is that you are a true football guy. You're not one of these analytics nerds. You, you've, you've agreed with them. They, they've axed the analytics. It was taking them nowhere in a hurry. That's right. And now you're on board with John the football Dorsey's guys, in. John Dorsey and Hugh Jackson, the football guys in the building it's running the show. Now we're going to start winning games. Football mentality. Your Watch, true colors have come out right now. Josh Gordon doesn't have Jimmy Smith on the other side to, to slow him down. True. Josh Gordon's going to continue to get better and break out here. How about our boy Joe Schobert leading all inside linebackers with 37 stops? Thanks for the stat, Taylor, and our trusty stat sheet here. I'm talking up the Browns. This is their week. Uh, no. All right. Everybody else has the Ravens. I don't completely disagree, but <laughs> I had this feeling for the for the Browns. It's tough to go 0-16. Your true colors have come out. You're a football guy. You're you're not buying this analytic stuff. It's what it is. Uh, hit up John Costco if you guys want any more Cleveland Browns nuggets. Find him on the Twitter machine. All right, one more game. It's the game of the week. New England Patriots traveling to the Pittsburgh Steelers. The number one seed is on the line here. The Steelers have uh, two losses. The Patriots have three losses. If New England wins, they'll both have three losses, and New England will control their destiny. If Pittsburgh wins, they do actually clinch the number one seed in the playoffs. This game could not be more important because number one seed's good and all that stuff, but if you look at New England historically and their playoff runs, when they when you have to go through New England, it is very difficult to beat them. So this game is even bigger maybe than people thought at the beginning of the season. Yeah, and it's going to be fun because the Patriots always come up with creative ways of playing Antonio Brown, who has been on absolute fire for the the Pittsburgh Steelers. Is he's been he unreal. A, is he a house of fire? Oh yeah, yeah. He's on fire. There's. Uh, but is that a different thing? Can you just be on fire without being a house of fire? Do you have to graduate to being a house of fire? He's little, so he's not a, not house, a house. But he's on fire. An outhouse of fire. He's in fuego. <laughs> um. He. You haven't heard that? A house? No, I haven't heard house of fire. Anyway. Antonio Brown's been destroying people. He is basically uncoverable one-on-one, unless for some reason you happen to be William Jackson III, who's the only human being in the NFL who can go one-on-one with Antonio Brown to cover him. Um, if you're not William William Jackson III, uh, you trade need help. Trade for him. Trade for him. Yes, trade for him or give him help. Uh, but the Patriots have been very good at doing that. They've been amongst the best teams of actually consistently going out there and bracketing Antonio Brown, coming up with creative ways of having a guy in trail technique underneath, making sure there's a safety over the top. The Ravens were doing a lot of that as well, except as we talked about, they kept coming up with a play every now and again that didn't do it. And every time they did that, they just tossed it 50 yards down the field to Antonio Brown. Well, that's the thing too. Like there is this, uh, there is this mentality with Roethlisberger and Brown where it's like, all right, if they're going to double you every now and again, we'll force some passes in there. But if they're going to single you, we're not going to miss this opportunity, yeah. and we're going to take that chance. Yes. We're going to take that shot, I mean, and, it, it, and it's been paying off. If they read single coverage, they're definitely going deep deep towards Antonio Brown and trying to get a big play out of it. So you can't, you can't work on the base that, well, we've got him doubled 75% of the time. That's probably good enough because they're, they're going to go after the 25% you don't and really make it uh, hurt. It's really a weird game because I, it, when you look at the other side, New England was supposed to roll against Miami, come into this game, and everybody's going to dig up the history and say, okay, they crushed Pittsburgh, so they're going to. The, now the mentality is, well, they got beaten by Miami. They were embarrassed by Miami. And normally when, when that happens to teams, you're like, okay, they got exploited. Everybody goes the other way with New England. They're like, okay, now they're mad. Yeah. This is a revenge game, and it's a good matchup against Pittsburgh because uh, here's what it comes down to. The same exact thing happened in the playoffs last year with Houston doing a pretty good job against Patriots offense, and Pittsburgh had one of two choices. They could duplicate, try to duplicate what Houston did, which is play this tight man coverage, which is not their game. No. Or they could stick with what they normally do, which is play a ton of zone, which Brady generally carves up. They went and played zone, and they got carved up. So is this the year where Pittsburgh comes out of their comfort level a little bit? Because the numbers historically with Brady against Pittsburgh are just insane. 29 touchdowns, three interceptions, and I usually don't buy into that stuff, but this is Brady going up against the same scheme. It's just a good matchup. He, he gets it. Do they come out of their comfort zone and try to play a different style? I don't think so because they just never have done it. Um, and we've talked before that I don't think it even – I think their own personnel is ill-suited for the scheme they like to play. 
we talked with another guy to pull out the old draft profiles, Artie Burns, the, the Steelers' uh, number one cornerback a couple of uh, years ago. Um, Artie Burns, the scouting report on him, I mean, for start, we didn't like the pick in the first round, but it was chiefly because of the fit. It was the scheme. You looked at him and he said, this guy cannot play zone at all. He looks pretty handy as a man cover corner going one-on-one -on -one with people, but in zone schemes, he just looks lost. He doesn't no feel for them, doesn't know what he's doing. It looks like Namdi Asimo out there where you put him in a zone scheme and it just it's a disaster. But he goes to the Steelers and they play more zone than anybody else in the league and they just don't ever look like changing that. So I think it's, it hurts them generally because a guy like Burns would be better in a man scheme and it hurts them especially against the Patriots, but I don't see them coming out of it. Uh, the one weird thing about Brady's game so far this year, passer rating of only 86.2 when he's been blitzed, uh, completion percentage only 56.9. The Steelers blitz a, not a ton, but they blitz above the league average. Number two pressure percentage in the entire NFL, and Brady usually crushes the blitz. It's usually His numbers against the blitz are usually among the league's best. Hasn't been the case, and I think that's because they're throwing the ball down the field more and he doesn't have... Edelman in that quick outlet. So I don't know. There's something about this game that makes me think if there's a year that Pittsburgh could get to New England's offense, maybe things are matching up a little bit better than they have in the past. I think this becomes a shootout. I don't think the Steelers will be able to stop Patri the Patriots and Brady carving them up. And then I think on the other side of the ball, the Steelers are just better across the board in terms of personnel and talent. So this should be hugely high scoring and a complete like it. it's, this is the game that the NFL has been trying to create for the past 30 years. All right, so you got, you're got you one of two people taking Pittsburgh. Yep. Nathan Yankee's also taking them. You've got Pittsburgh, what, like 50 to 47? Yeah, yeah, about that. All right, I'll take New England, 50 to 47 in a shootout. I'm with you. There you go. All right, that'll do it for us. That is your Week 15 preview. Don't forget to get to profootballfocus.com. Check out Edge and Elite. Use the promo code PFF10 for $10 off any of those packages. And hit that subscribe button. Stick with us at the PFF Podcast. We'll be back with you guys next week reviewing all of the Week 15 action. Thanks again for listening.